Uh, hi, thanks for choosing to, talk, uh, to come to our talk. Uh, my name is Adam and this is Tomek. We work at Sidar Medical. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, medical images and how we analyze them, how we use deep learning on them uh, to develop clinically useful applications. <coughs> and we'll uh, split the talk in two parts. First, Tomek will tell you a bit about what we do at Sidar and he'll focus on 3D me medical image segmentation. And then I'll uh, talk more about what we do with uh, segmentation and other computer vision algorithms to develop uh, useful applications for clinicians to treat patients. And with that, I'll give the floor to Tomek. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's first think about what is the kind of product that we are uh, working with. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so um, SIDAR EV is a solution that works during an um, aortic repair in an endovascular way. So it's, it's, it's an endovascular operation in which a surgeon do not directly see the organ that he's operating on, but he relies on the 2D imaging. So the, the thing you see on, on the left, the X-ray imaging, yes. And furthermore, um, the soft tissues are indirectly visible on, on X-rays. So to, without CIDAR, surgeons need to rely on injecting contrast to the patient's body to actually see the, the outline of the organ they are operating on. And the main feature of, of CIDAR is that it maps the 2D image acquired during the operation to the 3D anatomy that was acquired preoperatively and displays this uh, outline, this um, overlay of, of the aorta on top of the patient to help surgeons like navigate during the procedure when they use their tools and devices uh, inside, inside the body. And the interesting kind of technical thing here is that the main part runs in the cloud on multiple GPU enabled machines and it's displayed in the operating theater. Okay, but to get it, we need the segmentation uh, to, be, to be available. Yes, so let's quickly revisit what, what we mean by that. So medical image segmentation is a kind of fully or semi-automatic process that aims to delineate the interested anatomical structures. Yes, it can be organs, tissues, uh, tumors. It works on some medical imaging modality like computed tomography, uh, x-ray, uh, microscopic slide. And the output of it in discrete setting at least is like a segmentation map. Uh, let's say, okay, here is this organ or, or, or the other. Um, there has been a tremendous progress in recent years in kind of deep learning based uh, models. So UNET, which kind of is depicted here, is an encoder decoder uh, based model, which is kind of a baseline model for, for image segmentation. Uh, ha has already, I mean, made, made a kind of lot of change and NNUNET pronounced no new net is actually a framework around it that finds the best um, model configuration and pre and post processing steps depending on your data set characteristics. And it's kind of the standard for uh, medical image segmentation nowadays. It was in 2020, it was used in nine out of 10 top teams in 10 medical image challenges that were performed there. So that's great. Is the problem solved, even what we have now? Well, not really. Like here I show two quotes from some of the papers that still found that although in a kind of overall quantitative way they show quite well, quite good results, they still seem to, the mod these models seem to generate like anatomically implausible uh, results, which is not what we, let's say, want, especially in, in, in this scenario. To understand that, we need to revisit the metrics. Um, so two main metrics that are used to, to, to measure uh, segmentation quality are dice Sorensen coefficient, Hausdorff and Hausdorff distance. We'll focus more on the first one uh, today. So it's an overlap uh, metric that, that is, um, yeah, it's, it's presented visually here. It's kind of twice the overlap, twice the size of the overlap divided by the sum of uh, both of the set sizes. And it's like yeah, from zero to one. Zero means no overlap, one means a perfect overlap. Um, but it 
kind of comes with its pitfalls. It's a pixel-based uh, metric, so it kind of ignores the shape, the topology of the, of the result, yes? So on the right, you can see a few artificial examples of some predictions that all get the same dice score for, for a given reference shape. And they are all like totally different in terms of how, how do, like, a human would perceive them, yes? So, yeah, this is like the artificial example. How, how does this affect a real life? So um, here is, um, you can see a few segmentations of the aorta. Yes, aorta is the largest artery of, of the human body. It starts from the heart and then splits into, into smaller arteries. And on the left, you can see some segmentation prediction from, a, from, from our model, which gets like this value of the dice score. And on the right, you can see two manually perturbed versions of it. And the first one has like a gap down there, but it doesn't actually affect the dice score a lot, yes, because for it's kind of volumetric. Albeit, it's like clinical consequences, if, if someone would try to understand this segmentation, would be, would be really, I mean, really large because it suggests some, you know, blockage of the blood flow or something. At the same time, here you see a segmentation that has some erroneous over-segmentation, uh, and it has like a, different dice score now, it's, 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 it deviates more from the original one, although it, it would be clinically acceptable, yes, yeah? so this would be, th this is the kind of error that we kind of can handle. So we know there exists a discrepancy between um, commonly used metrics and the kind of human subjective uh, quality uh, estimate. So can we quantify this? This is a screenshot from one of the papers that tries uh, to do it. So they mm, presented uh, clinicians many segmentations and asked them to, to kind of say how good, how good they are on a scale of one to six. And then they tried to find the correlations between those and dozen of uh, segmentation metrics that are, that are used in the world. And what they found is that the correlation was like at most mild. So they, they found like, uh, that it was in the range of 0.4 to 0.5, the Pearson's correlation coefficient, for the best metric. So it's kind of the, uh, let's say, the, the best possible uh, example. We found that a similar effect in our internal experiments, that like the dice coefficient was widely correlated with uh, human assigned score of how well does this, um, how well is this segmented. Okay, so, uh, Let's think about what are the methods that we can use to nail down the problem. So uh, historically, there was, like before the deep learning um, era, there was a lot of effort in the segmentation algorithm, and some of them had like a built-in guarantees of, of the like, preserving topology, for example, due to how they worked. Now there is a trend to combine those, and it, it can be, if you think about it, it can either be com combined at the level of the kind of network structure architecture, so how you, mm, how you build the model to, uh, to behave, or it can be, we can use a kind of a classical CNN, but enforce it at the prior, as the, this prior at the loss level. And one of the examples is particularly important in like the vessel type of segmentations is a paper called CL dice, uh, center line dice loss, which I want to uh, cover a bit right now. So it works as, a, as an additional loss component in which we include a center line or, or a skeleton of a shape in the loss function. So center line or a skeleton is like a thin, minimized version of the shape that largely preserves the extent and, and topology of the original shape. And what the authors of this paper did is they made a differentiable um, skeletonization algorithm and in incorporated it directly in the, uh, in the loss functions so that the network can kind of be driven towards preserving the um, continuity and, and topology. Um, okay, what are other challenges? I will just briefly cover the technical challenges, so to say. So, um, 3D segmentation models, like especially like organ, large organ segmentations, requires tons of memory because if you want to pass like a volume of, you know, 500 
by 500 by 500. It's, it's quite a lot if we want to train a network on it. And there are a few solutions how to overcome it. One of them is to use a coarse to fine grade model, so cascaded one. When we first train a model on a low resolution to identify like the region of interest where, where is the, um, the actual uh, object. And then we train a fine grained model on a cropped, on a kind of cropped version which can be run on a, on a higher resolution. But it has some drawbacks, yes, it makes it complicated, it's, it's multi-stage, it's prone to error propagation. The other solution is block sampling. Uh, I show you like a 2D uh, version of it, but in 3D it gets even like uh, harder. So we can sample blocks from the whole volume, yes, because the whole won't fit into memory, we'll just look at a part of it. But we face challenges like missing context, because kind of to solve the segmentation problem, looking at just a small part of the image might not be possible because you, you don't have the context around. But you can as well like sample blocks that have no or very low uh, amount of the foreground classes which makes like the uh, optimization process harder because it's a different distribution than, than the original one. Okay, uh, to kind of summarize this part. Mm. I showed that medical segmentation is kind of still a challenging um, task, it's an area of an active research, and we've been able to, kind of inspired by the work done, to use it and apply it in a kind of working product. So how does this work then? So whenever a, a new CT scan comes in to our system, it gets directly segmented by the deep learning uh, model, and then is available for the clinician in a planning tool to work on. And previously, before this model was introduced, clinicians need to do it manually using some region growing and tools for, for correcting the, the segmentations. And it took quite a lot of time. Like applying this, this kind of algorithm saves them 20 minutes for every case they, they, they work on. And they can focus on what they kind of want to do, which is they insert those virtual guide wires that help them during the operation and plan and decide on kind of what to do. Okay, and I will now uh, let Adam tell you about like what's, wh what else can we do with the medical uh, image segmentation. Thanks, Tomek. Uh, hopefully, you learned something uh, new about medical image segmentation. Uh, now, I'm going to focus on applications beyond segmentation, but using segmentation as well as kind of base base layer. Um, and I'll uh, split my part in in three subparts. Uh, first, I'll tell you a bit more about the disease that we're helping to treat and what affects patient outcomes and how we can affect them. Uh, in, indirectly using our software. Uh, then I'll try to convince you that we have a unique uh, database uh, which probably no clinicians have uh, the access to kind of outside of uh, CIDAR. And uh, then I'll spend some time to describe uh, an experiment that we did uh, and I call it find similar patients. And uh, the basic premise is how to represent very information-rich data, like CT scans, into something interpretable and comparable. Um, so endovascular aneurysm repair is a procedure uh, that helps patients with a, an aneurysm on the, the main vessel in their body, uh, the aorta. And an aneurysm is a, is a bulge, is a weakening of the walls of the aorta. And one way of treating this disease is to insert a stent graft, which is this white uh, device, into the aorta to prevent the blood from flowing into the aneurysm uh, and therefore expanding it even more. 
uh, because that can lead to rupture, and that's uh, very often fatal for the patient. Uh, but this procedure uh, does not come without risks, and uh, according to some studies, there is uh, more than 15% chance of a patient coming back into the operating theater within the first uh, within the three years after the initial one, uh, the initial procedure. And just to give you an example of what can go wrong, uh, an endo leak is a complication where the, the seal between the device and the aortic walls is not good enough, and there's still some blood flowing into the aneurysm, and it's still expanding. So a patient will be monitored after a procedure, and uh, if, if the uh, doctor sees that uh, the disease is still there and still expanding, they'll try to do another procedure. Uh, and I tend to think there are two main factors affecting the outcomes and how successful a treatment is. The first is uh, the patient themselves, uh, their anatomy, comorbidities, uh, general state of health. But we can't really control that. I mean, we can uh, do our best with segmentation, uh, with annotating the data, uh, but the patient, you know, they, they come as, as they are. Uh, and then there are clinical decisions, and these are things like what sort of device the clinician, the doctor will use during the operation, where exactly they will place it in, in the patient's body, um, or what other um, kind of adjunct procedures they will carry out during the surgery. And these two factors affect outcomes. Uh, and we can definitely have some control indirect on the, on the second part, the clinical decisions, because as Tomek sh showed you, uh, we provide the software for planning these procedures, as well as guidance during uh, the surgery. Uh, I want to uh, take a brief detour to explain a little bit how knowledge and experience is disseminated in the medical community, uh, using terms that we are familiar with as programmers. Uh, so they have something like code review, which would be uh, meetings every few days, I guess, uh, to review previous operations, and more experienced surgeons will share their knowledge experience uh, with um, the, the less experienced ones. Uh, and that happens kind of within operating teams, within hospitals. Uh, there is literature, of course. The, the most uh, useful from our perspective is uh, when researchers look at uh, large cohorts of, of patients uh, retrospectively and try to identify causal relationships between what happened during procedure or planning and what the outcomes were. Uh, then there are conferences, um, and on, on some of these conferences, it's, it's quite cool, they have live streaming of of a live operation, so there would be an audience like you guys, and they'd be watching an, a patient being operated, uh, sometimes using SIDAR uh, to help with, with guidance and navigation. And then there is, of course, the very well-known surgeon stack overflow, where surgeons ask um, for help when they have a complicated patient anatomy. Uh, of course, there isn't such a thing. <laughs> But I mention it not just to make a joke. They don't, the, the, the problem is that surgeons don't have this readily available source of information about patients that they don't, haven't, the, the anatomies that they haven't encountered before um, or other kind of out, of, after, out of their own experience distribution um, cases. Uh, whereas we, even if we, uh, it's very unlikely that we've come across a programming problem that no one ever has uh, come across before. But even if we do, if we ask a question of, on Stack Overflow, we probably get an answer within a couple of days, maybe. Um, but also my point is that we at uh, SIDAR have already helped with about 3,000 operations of this specific disease, and that's much more than any, even the most experienced surgeon in the world uh, have seen. 
So a surgeon will have a very deep knowledge of a patient. They'll follow them along through, throughout their treatment, uh, but they may not have as much breadth of, of knowledge. And uh, just because you know they work at, a, at one aortic center, so they see a specific demographics of patients, uh, or maybe they have a, uh, they have other constraints, like they can only use one type of device at their center. Uh, so we're part of our goal and mission is to think hard how to enable clinicians to tap into this uh, wide and deep pool of uh, information that we have at CIDAR with CT scans and imagery from, uh, from the uh, procedures. And the experiment that we did, and I want to describe that now, uh, the, the find similar patients experiment, is when uh, we've got a, a CT scan uploaded to our system, and then the goal is to do something with the scan and display similar patients, uh, similar anatomies uh, that we've seen in the past. Uh, and that comes with, you know, planning information, so what type of devices have been used for, the, uh, for those patients, uh, a, the, the user querying our database for, for similar uh, cases, similar patients, can also review the imagery from, from the procedures, uh, and they can get information about the outcomes uh, for, these, for these patients. Uh, but the crucial question is here, yeah, how to define similarity between anatomies. Are these anatomies similar? Well, both of these patients have aneurysms. Pretty much all of our patients do. Uh, one is a bit lower down, one is a bit higher up. Uh, maybe the one on the right has a little longer iliac arteries uh, below. But are they similar clinically? Are they going to get a similar treatment? Um, how, to, how to define that? So we could go about it naively and use our 3D binary segmentation model, the, the unit, and chop off the decoder part and use the embeddings in the, in the middle, calculate the distances, uh, you know, a, a met, uh, distance of choice, cosine distance, Euclidean distance, and uh, say that if the distance is lower, patients are more similar. Uh, we can be a bit uh, smarter about it and use existing literature on similarity, things like triplet loss and uh, Siamese networks are used for that. Uh, we'd have to get uh, explicit labels about pairs of scans which are similar or dissimilar. And then we would train a neural net uh, to output an embedding, a, a vector that, again, we can calculate distances um, between these vectors uh, from different scans, from different patients. Uh, we've tried similar approaches, not specifically for similarity, but for, for classification. Uh, but we think that the results are uh, kind of applicable also to similarity. Uh, the problem is that even though we have a big data set for medical standards, 3,000 CT scans annotated, um, the, these CT scans contain a lot of information. These are millions of voxels, uh, as in 3D pixels, and uh, they, they also contain a lot of information that we don't, that it, which are not that um, relevant for this specific, uh, specific disease. There are, you know, there are lungs in there, there are other organs in there, and we want to focus on the aorta. And the uh, papers that I've cited there, and I mentioned the, the other approaches uh, to finding similarity, they use either a million of uh, 2D images, like similar faces, or uh, thousands of CAD models from which they can uh, create projections and uh, generate the similar or dissimilar data. Uh, so we decided that we'll use more of our in-house domain knowledge uh, to represent the anatomy in a way that's 
comparable. And also a good side effect would be if, it, if it's interpretable, uh, because in the end we're going to show it to clinicians and it's a, you know, it's a feature. If, if the data, uh, the, the, the black box that they're uh, given has some, uh, it gives outputs which are interpretable. Uh, Tomek already mentioned the center line or the skeleton. So we're going to use that. Um, because it's a useful 1D coordinate system that we can apply to all of the segmentations that we get from the CT scans. Uh, the second component of this is uh, our geometrical features. So these are, you could call them more traditional computer vision algorithms, uh, which calculate geometrical features on the, on the segmentation uh, along the center line things like how bendy the aorta is, or what is the cross-sectional area of, um, of the segmentation along the center line again. So with this, we end up with a bunch of 1D features, but the remaining problem is that we need to align them, because CT scans come, they're not standardized. They, some, some of them end at the neck level, some would end at the lung level, and anything in between. Uh, so we trained another, another segmentation model, and this time a semantic uh, segmentation one, where each label corresponds to uh, a, you know, a clinically defined segment of the aorta. Uh, so now we can align of our, all of our patients' CT scans, uh, say, at the, with, with, with the anchor at the top of the abdominal segment of the aorta, or uh, another segment of your choice. So the, these three components, the center line, the geometrical features, and the semantically labeled aorta, allow us to create plots like the one in the center here, where we have the query, uh, the, th uh, the, the segmentation, the anatomy on the left, um, along with three nearest neighbors, and the, the feature is one of those geometrical, the feature plotted, uh, represented by the lines, is one of the geometrical features that I mentioned. And that way we can query our database for patients which are, for example, the most similar in the, uh, in, in the visceral region, where the uh, arteries that which are coming off to, uh, to feed blood to other organs uh, are, or you know, similar in the upper, upper segment of the aorta. And we can give different weights to different segments. Uh, and we can use different features to, uh, to compute similarity. And the similarity computation itself is, uh, could be just uh, like a cosine distance between these lines. Uh, and we, we believe that's, that's useful because we're showing clinicians uh, Again, similar patients from the past. We're not really telling them what to do. Doctors don't really take it lightly if you tell them what to do. Um, but we're exposing the, them to, to much more information that would be available to them otherwise. So then they can choose the right uh, course of treatment um, and you know, re-examine the, the patient with uh, the, the extra information we're giving to them. Uh, so, in summary, I hope that I uh, managed to convince you that we have this unique database and there are probably other databases scattered around the world which are useful and the problem is for companies with the access to those databases to, to give clinicians access to them in a way that's uh, clinically useful. Then, my second point was that large-scale Facebook-style similarity measures will probably not work for such data sets um, because the inputs are very information-rich and you probably will have to use some domain knowledge to compress the information. Uh, and finally, we did an experiment which we think the results were useful. They were evaluated internally by our experts. Um, 
So if you have domain experts at your, at your um, institution, at your company, uh, you know, talk to them, what, uh, figure out what they think is important in, in the data that you're analyzing and uh, try to put it into, uh, put it into your, your solution. Finally, I just want to mention that we are expanding our team, uh, so feel free to reach out if you find what we're doing interesting. And with that, I'll open the floor for questions. Hi, everyone. Just raise your hand if you have a question. Hi, uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, my question is regarding the similarity checks. Um, my understanding is sometimes similarity checks can fail. So um, how do you get to handle those cases where um, the results are not actually similar due to some of the uh, drawbacks of using a deep learning system to extract, to extract um, similar features? So how do you get to handle those failure scenarios or sense check that they're actually correct? If I understood, is that working? If, if I understood correctly, the question is how do we check for uh, failures in our similarity checks and you know, how do we account for them and how, how do we prevent them from happening in, yes, in the yes. future? Well, it's, we, we can of course have some selected test cases um, and, and have unit tests uh, kind of on, on the data, but Mostly, I think it's, it's also very important to design the, the software or solution in a way that failure is not catastrophic. So we can still show uh, a, ca a patient's anatomy, which is, according to the clinician, will not really be similar, but the, it, 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 won't, you know, it won't affect their, uh, their decision making because they can uh, we, we, we are giving them the freedom to use, use the information uh, in, in the way that they, uh, they think is mo most appropriate. Uh, so, so it's maybe about not being too, uh, too explicit with the uh, kind of conclusions of your algorithms. It's, it's giving the, the expert uh, room to decide. Hello, it's fantastic to see how CIDAR technologies come along so far over the years. Um, I work with large medical data sets and, I've, and I'm wondering whether you have any plans to uh, combine the anatomical similarity that comes from the scans with a measure of similarity based on patient diagnosis or patient medical history. So similarity of metadata versus similarity of anatomy. Do you want to take that one? That's, 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 work. that's a hard question, I would say. Uh, so cannot say anything about the plans precisely here. What I just see is that it would serve a bit of a different purpose, yes. Uh, so, um, like, just for, for helping to the clinician to plan the operation, to decide on what to do it. Yeah, comparing the anatomy seems like the, the first thing to do, concentrating on metadata, on previous uh, patient history, I see it as like a, for, for, a, different, for a different purpose. Uh, Hi, really interesting talk. Um, I want to ask about um, getting the technology into the NHS or another system like that, so it's talking to your cloud, but in particular getting data into and out of those places. Are you covered by the same sort of embargoes on patient-specific or PII-based data, um, given it's just sort of only anatomical, um, and how do you get around that? Okay, could you just repeat the second part? So, so um, how do you, uh, are there patient privacy concerns uh, with the type of data that you have if it's just anatomical, and how do you get around those if so? But how do you connect to um, a hospital network, for instance, so it can talk to your cloud and back? Because my understanding of the NHS in particular would be that that would not be allowed, but clearly it is. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, we're, we're just fortunate as machine le learning engineers to have experts in the company who deal with that part. So we, you know, we, we're fully regulated and uh, we've got our, uh, in the UK, it's the uh, Caldecott Guardian who kind of deals with the data privacy uh, aspect of that. So they're, they'll, they deal directly with the NHS and, and the hospitals to, to get the data uh, in, a, uh, in an approved way. Is there any more questions? Great, okay. Thanks very much, guys. Um, if you have any more questions, you can get in touch with the guys uh, on the Slack or Twitter. Okay. Cheers. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day.